morning church i greet you in the matchless name of our lord and savior jesus christ i hope all of you are doing well amidst this unprecedented time that has descended out of the blue upon all of us there is none that uh, hasn't been affected by this covid-19 pandemic and uh, i believe that god surely wants to teach us some important lessons as we go through this time of trial and testing let us look to the lord in try, prayer and start this worship service father god we come before you at this time and we know that you are sovereign you are almighty you are omnipotent and the bible also tells us that you are a good god you care for us you are our shepherd and so father when times of adversity descend upon us naturally a lot of questions arise in our minds about your goodness about your power about your will but father we know we have tasted your goodness and we have seen you at work in our life time and again and so father we rest on this confidence we have this hope that you have delivered us in the past you will deliver us and in the future whenever we come across anything you will deliver us because of the name of your son lord jesus be with us as we worship you together be with us as we learn from your word together giving you all glory majesty honor and praise we ask this prayer in the matchless name of our lord and savior jesus christ amen shall we start this worship service by singing a song and praising our lord as the dew and snow the water so my soul longs after you The word of God for today is taken from Psalm 95 verses 1 to 8. Psalm 95 verses 1 to 8 and I'll be reading to you from the New International Version which goes like this. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. 
Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for he is our God. And we, the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did at Meribah, as you did that day at Massa in the desert. This is the word of God. Friends, this is a psalm of worship. Literally, the Jews in the Old Testament, when they used to go up to the tabernacle or to the temple to worship God, they used to sing this psalm as uh, they reached the temple. For the Israelites, worshipping God was not merely a matter of going to services three times a week or once a year or on prescribed days of the year. Although services and religious practices were important, for the Jews, there was no difference between religious and non-religious activity. If they treated people unfairly or disobeyed the commands of God, if they treated people unjustly, then religious observance counted for nothing. Now if we look at Exodus chapter 20 verse 3, the first of the Ten Commandments which God gives Israel through Moses, the first commandment says, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall have no other gods before me. Now, today's English Bible paraphrases that as worship no other god but me. I find that so strange. The first command that God gives Israel is worship no other god but me. Israel was God's, Jehovah's chosen people. They had seen the ten plagues descending upon Egypt. They had seen the dividing of the Red Sea. They had seen the annihilation of Pharaoh's army. What the Egyptian army was one of the strongest armies of that time. And they were free after 430 years of forced labor and slavery. It, all this was only because of God. So, they should have been filled with gratitude, awe, fear and wonder. And they should have thankfully, gratefully worshipped God happily. Yet, the first command that God gives them is worship no other God but me. Thou shalt have no other God before me. God knew how difficult it would be for the Israelites as well as for us to keep this command. Because if we look at the history of Israel throughout the Old Testament, we see how often Israel stumbled at this point, how often, how easily they bowed down before foreign gods and goddesses. In fact, ironically, this first command had been broken before Moses brought it down from the mountain and gave it to the people. When Moses brought the Ten Commandments down, he saw a sight that made him distraught. 
the Israelites were worshipping and dancing before the golden calf. And therefore, in Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 7, Moses repeats this command before the new generation. The Ten Commandments. You know, after 40 years of wandering due to disobedience and rebellion, they are about to enter the foreign, the promised land. And Moses again reminds them, be careful to obey the commands that the Lord gives you. Remember what happened because you did not obey the commands that God gave you. Now Psalm 91 Sorry, Psalm 95 is a call or a summons to worship that is as appropriate for us today as it was for the Hebrew worshippers who first used it, used it many centuries ago. And we see that it starts off with the worship leader exhorting the people of God, saying, Come. Let us shout for joy, let us sing for joy, let us shout aloud. And then, let us come before him with thanksgiving. And then in verse 3 and 4 and 5, the people respond. Again in verse 6, the worship leader says, come, let us bow down in worship. The first thing that the worship leader mentions here that is an important component of worship an important part of worship is joy he says come let us sing for joy to the Lord let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation let us sing for joy and we see here the steps of worship being prescribed for us not that there is any definite uh, steps, but a few uh, indications of what all is necessary when we worship God. And the first thing that the worship leader mentions, the psalmist mentions here, is joy. Come, let us sing for joy. Very often, when we come to worship, our hearts are not filled with joy. Our faces don't display that we are in the presence of a living God. Our faces look morose. We are sad. Yes, all of us are burdened by worries and different sorts of problems. But God expects us to come with a, with a feeling of joy. Now there is a difference between joy and happiness. You know, happiness depends on happenings. Something happens and therefore we become happy. But joy does not de depend on circumstances. Joy is something that is deep inside us. It is constant. And in fact, Nehemiah says that the joy of the Lord is my strength. We see Paul in the book of Philippians, Philippians is known as the prison epistle because it was written while Paul was in prison. Mm -hmm. And in fact, he uses the word joy or its different forms of the word joy at least eight times. How can a person talk about joy when he is in prison? The second aspect of worship that we see the psalmist mentioning is thanksgiving. 
let us come before him with thanksgiving. And this thanksgiving is also often missing in our worship. We come before him with complaining or grumbling like the Israelites, not satisfied with what we have, always wanting more, always wanting better. And that happens because we compare ourselves with people who are better off than us. That is why we are always left wanting, we always want more. But if we would compare ourselves with people who are lesser off than us, then we would always be thankful. For example, I can say, Father God, that pastor, he has a car. I only have a motorcycle. Please give me a car. And if I have that attitude, I can never come with thanksgiving to the Lord. But if I look at some other pastor in a village who just has a bicycle, and I say, Lord, he only has a cycle. At least I have a motorcycle. I thank you for that. Then I will always have an attitude of gratitude. I will always be thankful whenever I come into the presence of God. And then of course, he talks about let us extol him with music and song. Extol him. Let us praise him. Praise is an essential part of our worship. We praise God through our singing. We praise God through our giving. But praise is more internal than it is vocal. Oh, I may shout ha hallelujah. Oh, I may loudly shout praise the Lord. Yet my heart may not be in a right condition with God, then my praise is worthless. I may be singing beautifully. I may be playing the guitar. And yet, if my heart is not right with God, then my beautiful voice or my talents are of no use. And in response, the people say, For the Lord is the great God. He is the great King among all gods. In His hands are the depths of the earth. The mountain peaks belong to Him. The sea is His, for He made it. And His hands form the dry land. Now remember, Israel was surrounded by people who worshipped gods and they had gods for different areas. They had a god for the mountains. They had a god for the forest. They had a god for the sea. They had a god for the dry land. And here the, the psalmist reinforces that all these are created not by different gods, but by one god, our god, Jehovah. Acknowledging God's sovereignty and His power. And this should lead the people to bow down in worship. Then the leader exhorts the people to say, Come, let us bow down. Let us kneel before our God. Bowing down and kneeling, which is symbolizing our submissiveness and our humility. And in verse 7, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture. Not only is he the God of the mountains, not only is he the God of the seas, not only is he the God of the forests, not only is he the God of the dry land, 
but he is also our God. A personal relationship is established here. And we are his people. We are his people. We are his own. So filled with joy, thanksgiving, praise and wonder and humility, the people are ready now to listen to God's message. But all of a sudden, the tone changes. All of a sudden, the voice changes and words that shock you. Today, if you hear God's word, do not harden your hearts. What is happening here? But then as we meditate, as we pause to think, we realize that worship is never complete unless we open ourselves to God's correction and direction. In fact, the next psalm, Psalm 96 verse 9, tells us, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. My friends, I may be dressed very well, I may put on makeup, oh, I may have a beautiful attire, I may have a beautiful voice, I may have uh, so many attributes. All these things do not make my worship beautiful to God. It is only holiness that makes my worship beautiful to God. I may not have a nice voice, or I may be singing flat. It does not matter. It is worship that makes, it is holiness that makes worship beautiful to God. The easier components in worship are given first. Joy, thanksgiving, praise. Then the difficult ones, humility, submitting to God's will. And then the last and the most important step of worship self-examination and openness to change and willing to be transformed. My friends, stubbornness to change can make our worship incomplete. I may say, I have been worshipping God for so many years. I have been coming to church for so many years. And yet, if there is no change in my words, in my speaking with others, in my dealing with others, if there is no change in my attitude, if there is no change in my conduct, if there is no change in my habits, if there is no change in my behavior, then my worship counts for nothing. You remember what Paul tells the Roman church? Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. When we offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, this is our spiritual act of worship. If we are not willing to change, if I do not want to change my ways, if I am not willing to be transformed into the likeness of Christ, if I am not willing to obey God's word, then my worship is of no use. My friends, yes, joy, thanksgiving, praise, gratitude, Humility and submissiveness to God should be there in our worship. But the most important part of our worship is a willingness to change, a willingness to be transformed into the image of Jesus. Because that is God's goal for us. Thank you. May God.
bless us. Let us look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come before you at this time. And we thank you for reminding us from the word about the importance of transformation. Once we have come to you, once we have met you, it is not that instantaneously we will change, but a slow process of change is initiated by the Holy Spirit. And we keep on progressing. We keep on moving in transformation, in change. If we are stubborn to change, then our worship is incomplete and superficial. Help us to understand that. Help us to open ourselves to your correction. Giving you all glory, honor, majesty and praise. In Jesus' name we ask this prayer. Amen. Now, may the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest and abide with each and every person who is watching this program until the last day of our journey here on earth. Amen.